By mud moss, by hope stone, these hard words and stories are. By mother's grave and by her kindness, here's the heart, the heart, the home. This is the heart, the heart, the home. By Cinder's song and Mary's dance, by Hans here and Ashley's chance. By muddy feet and mossy coat, by orange tree, by cow, by goat. By orange tree, by cow, by goat. And with these seeds that we do so, we'll watch them grow, we'll watch them grow. By child forgotten and girl alone, by tented flame and gathered bone. Remembered long and still unknown, these are the wonders we have grown. These are the wonders we have grown. And with these seeds that we have sown, we'll watch them grow, we'll watch them grow. By sound of song, by leaf, by hum, these are the wonders seed at home. By sound of song, by leaf, by hum, these are the wonders seed at home. By sound of song, by leaf, by hum, these are the wonders seed at home. By sound of song, by leaf, by hum, these are the wonders seed at home. He's all the one who's seated home. Capital city Cinderella. The truth is, Cinderella was black. She wore her hair in box braids, had a beautiful smile, and she loved to read and write. But the story was anglicised, and in true fairy tale tradition, the skin of the damsel in distress had been described as white. She travelled from foreign to London, was brought over to stay with a member of her family. A new adventure lay ahead. The first time on a plane, she embraced this journey happily. She arrived ready to attend secondary school, entitled to the free education. Instead, she found herself abused, exploited, mistreated, and then abandoned one night not far from a police station. There was no Prince Charming, glass slipper, mask, ball, or fray godmother there. After a traumatic interview at the home office, she ended up as a child in local authority care. Fast forward a few years, she's now a care leaver, 
but her claims and her appeals for asylum have been turned down because the immigration police, it seems, don't believe her. Retelling her story numerous times impacted on her mental health and well-being of that. There is no doubt. Threats of being sent back to foreign, plus not being entitled to any money, caused her to really act out. She felt helpless, hopelessness, had a breakdown, was sectioned and also heavily medicated. Resilience was her strength though, plus she also appreciated the support she got from the few people who showed they cared and were properly dedicated. There were dark moments when she wondered if to be dead would be better than the life she was experiencing, which at times had been severe. She found herself voicing her worries to a worker who told her not to give up and how important it is to always persevere. So, Cinderella continues to fight. She just wants an indefinite leave to remain. Plus, all her friends are here. She wants to be free to continue learning and get a job and live her life without the deportation fear. If only there was a genie in a lamp that could make her one wish come true, or maybe a magic wand which could be waved. But it seems like the Home Office is the evil stepmother with the ultimate power to decide which person should go back to foreign or who should be saved. This is a true tale, which hasn't yet got its happily ever after. Because unfortunately, there are more like her, a capital city Cinderella, each facing their own immigration disaster. Sheet moss, feather moss, shiny seductive moss, fire moss, plume moss, spoon-leaved moss. There was once a wise woman who lived at the edge of the village with her daughter. Every day she would gather moss as she looked after her daughter. Moss from the trees, moss from the stones, moss from the roofs of the houses, and every night she would weave the moss into the finest garment. One day, the garment was almost finished and her daughter was almost of age. And this is where our story begins. There was a knock at the door. Her daughter rushed to answer it and there was the landlord, a lean, greasy streak of a man who was known for being too familiar with young girls who were too polite to tell him no. The landlord had in his hand a basket of ribbons and the daughter reached out to take one and as she did so, he caught her hand in his and he said, there now, we should make this official. You should marry me. The daughter's stomach dropped and she closed the door, ran back into her mother and said, mother, the landlord's here and he wants to marry me. Her mother said, well, do you want to marry him? No, of course I don't. Well then, you should do exactly as I say. The daughter returned to the front door with instructions, opened them and said to the landlord, I cannot marry you unless I have a wedding dress. It should be made of the finest satin, it should be covered in gold embroidery and it needs to fit me perfectly. She closed the door and the landlord skipped away with glee. That should keep him busy, thought the mother. Time passed, but not enough of it. And soon enough, the landlord was back with a package wrapped in tissue paper, which he handed to the daughter. The daughter brought it back into her mother and says, well, he's got the dress while well, I'm afraid you need to try it on. And sure enough, it fit perfectly. This is what you must say next. You should return to the landlord and tell him that although you have a dress to get married in, you certainly don't have anything else suitable to wear for going away. He needs to get you a second dress, one that is made of silk and the color of all the birds in the air and it must fit you perfectly. The daughter returned to the door and relayed her instructions and the landlord skipped away with delight. That should keep him busy, thought the daughter. Time passed, 
and not enough of it. And the landlord returned with a paper package and handed it to the girl who woefully walked inside to try it on and it fit perfectly. I've got an idea, said the daughter to her mother. And she returned to the door and told the landlord that she may have two beautiful dresses, but she couldn't go dancing in hobnail boots. She needed slippers, silver ones, and they should fit her perfectly. The landlord leered a little more as he looked at her feet to measure them, and off he went to find the slippers. Time passed, and not enough of it, and the landlord returned with a shoebox, and sure enough, the slippers fit perfectly. Well, now what do I do, said the daughter. You should tell the landlord that you will not marry him until 10 o'clock in the morning tomorrow. You need time to wash your hair. And when you've sent him away, come back, bring me my sewing things and you need to pack. The daughter did as she was told and sent away the landlord who merrily skipped off to find a vicar to marry them. She brought her mother her sewing things and went to bed early having packed. All night the mother sewed and at the first light of morning the garment was ready. The daughter returned to her mother with the bags packed and her mother said, I have a gift for you, my child. This is your mossy coat. It is made with all the magic of all of the moss. To use this magic, all you need do is put on the coat and make a truly held wish. And when you do so, that wish will help you. So pick up your bag, kiss me goodbye, and tell me what do you wish for most in the world right now? I wish to be a long way away from here. And faster than thought, she was. She flew through the air, feeling the wind on her face, and she did not dare open her eyes until she felt herself land on gravel many hours later. She realised she was on a gravel driveway, and holding her mossy coat tight around her, she wished for some work or something to do as she walked up to the big house. The lady of the house answered the door. A mossy coat explained her situation and said that she was looking for work. Although I already have a cook, said the lady of the house, I'm sure I could find you work as an undercook, perhaps. And the lady of the house showed Mossy Coat downstairs. Undercook? The staff were in uproar. How dare this young thing swan into the kitchen and get herself declared undercook? Mossy Coat was given the worst jobs. They were an ignorant bunch in the kitchen. That kind of folk which are just ignorant enough to be mean-spirited to others and jealous, but not bright enough to do anything creative about it. They gave her the worst jobs, the greasy jobs, the smelly jobs. And every time she so much as put a smile out of place, they took the great big spoon that they used to skim the fat off the stew and cracked her over the head with it. After a few weeks, her beauty was lost in the mess and the grime of it all. And if she stumbled in her carrying or if she was late with a task, crack went the spoon across the back of her head. Summer ball season began. And the first ball was set to be a grand three-day affair. And although Mossy Coat went to sleep every night with her Mossy Coat as a pillow, hoping that the pain would go away, and she was there for a reason, her luck changed. The lady of the house invited her to speak to her that day and asked Mossy Coat to go to the ball with the family. Mossy Coat said, well, I can't possibly go to the ball. I'm terribly greasy and I just embarrass you. As she walked back down the kitchen stairs, the gossip began in earnest. Were you fired? Did you have to hand in your notice? Have you been caught stealing? And when Mossy Coat said she'd been invited to the ball, the great greasy spoon came out and crack over the back of her head for lying. Well, the next day, the talk was of nothing but the ball. The young master of the house had turned up and he never went to anything social. 
a mossy coat to her surprise found that the lady of the house came and asked her again if she wanted to go to the ball. Mossy coat said of course she couldn't, she was far too greasy and filthy, she just embarrassed them. And when the kitchen staff saw that she'd been speaking to the mistress, they asked her once more and crack over the back of the head for lying. That night, Mossy Coat was determined to go to the ball. She put her Mossy Coat on and walked down into the kitchen where the kitchen staff were gambling and drinking. And she walked up to each member of the kitchen staff and smiled at them like the rays of the sun. And holding her coat tight around her, she wished and they fell asleep one by one. She ran back upstairs in the house and she scrubbed herself and cleaned herself and put on the satin dress with the gold embroidery over her mossy coat. She held her coat tight around her and wished and faster than thought, she was at the ball. She was on the lawn of a big house and as she stepped inside, she could hear the clinking of glassware and the sounds of music. She only took a few steps into the room and she was the social hit of the season. Everyone wanted to know who she was and where she was from and why they had never seen her before. She was beautiful. And the young master of the house saw her too. He walked up to her and tried to ask her to dance and she said no, but he stayed to talk and she stayed to listen. And by the end of the evening, she relented. As the strains of the last waltz were played, she danced with him. She whirled and twirled around the ballroom with him. And when finally the last notes died away and everyone turned to applaud the musicians, Mossy Coat slipped her hand from his and she ran out of the door. She held her coat tight around herself and out she flew, wishing she was back in the kitchen and there she was. She sprinkled water on each of the kitchen staff and one by one they woke up terribly embarrassed that they'd fallen asleep down here and they begged and pleaded with Mossy Coat that she didn't tell the mistress. Well, she didn't and the greasy spoon was left on the hook that night. The next morning, the gossip was flying. You've lost your chance there, they said. The young master was dancing with this new lady. No one's heard of her before. Was she a princess? Was she a fairy? Was she the daughter of a billionaire? Nobody knew. And for the third time, the lady of the house asked whether Mossy Coat wanted to go to the ball. Mossy Coat said no, she'd just be an embarrassment and she thanked the lady of the house but she knew what she was doing that evening. She put her mossy coat on, walked down into the kitchens and smiled at all of the kitchen staff who one by one fell asleep in the rays of the sun. She scrubbed and cleaned herself, stood outside wearing her beautiful dress the colour of all the birds of the air and wished and found herself faster than thought at the ball. The interest in her the second night was even greater and she could barely move for all the people asking her who she was and where she was from. And when the young master of the house had gone off to get them drinks, the lady of the house spoke to Mossy Coat, not recognising her in the slightest, and asked her where she came from. Mossy Coat managed to say, that she came from a place where she was regularly hit over the head with the back of a spoon. And the lady of the house thought this was a very strange answer, but felt that her son would be safe with this curious and honest girl. Mossy Coat refused to dance with the master of the house until the very last waltz. They whirled and twirled across the floor and as the final notes were dying away, Mossy Coat slipped her hand from his and ran out into the night. The young master of the house had made plans and there on the lawn was a very fast horse. As Mossy Coat fled onto the lawns, the young master followed her, got on the horse and as Mossy Coat lifted up into the air, wishing to be back in the kitchens, he reached up a hand and plucked a slipper. Mossy Coat went back to the house and woke all the kitchen staff. 
and the young master travelled back to the house, not knowing it was the same one, and went to bed sick. It was so sick, it was said next morning, that he would die if he did not find the owner of this slipper. The doctors were called and no other remedy was available. And so there was a great hoo-ha. Everyone who had been to the ball was called to come and try on the slipper. And what a lot of feet that brought. Big feet, small feet, ugly feet, smelly feet. And not one of them fit. And then all of the staff from the house were asked to try on the slipper. And not one of them fit. And the lady of the house realised that Mossy Coat hadn't been asked to the queue. And she found her in the kitchen scrubbing a pot. Out Mossy Coat came, and sure enough, the slipper fit perfectly. The young master of the house looked at Mossy Coat and was just about to say something when Mossy Coat said, hang on a moment. She went upstairs and put on the beautiful white satin dress and came down, and suddenly everyone believed her. They all had seen her at the ball. And once again, the young master was about to speak, but no. Mossy Coat ran and found her Mossy Coat and put it on over her dress. That's much more me, she said to the people, for this is my Mossy Coat and I am Mossy Coat. This is how you should know me. The young master asked her to marry him and a wedding was arranged and the lady of the house found herself newer, kinder kitchen staff. And they all lived happily. Spoon-leaved moss, feather moss and fire moss, shiny, seductive moss. Long, long ago, and just as far from here, on the island of Hispaniola, Hurricanes rampage through villages, ripping up trees and stomping across fields. And in one of these villages lived a young black boy named T, with skin the colour of cinnamon bark and long thin limbs that hung down like the twigs of a tree. T lived with his siblings on his parents' farm toiling all day under the blazing hot sun, working in their fields. Fields of golden corn, cassava and yams. But even though he was surrounded by all of these wonderful, delicious provisions, T was always hungry. He felt that pinch of an aching, empty belly. You see, his mother had died and his father had taken another wife. And this new mother, she cared for them very little and she fed them even less. And so they spent their days toiling, digging, planting, hoeing in the earth until sometimes their fingers were almost raw to the bone. But one evening, when T thought no one was around. He stepped into the kitchen and he spied three oranges nestled in a bowl on the kitchen table. They looked like golden balls of treasure and the smell, oh, that bittersweet smell just filled the room. He sniffed, he was hungry. And before he knew what he was doing, his little fingers had crept out, reached into the bowl and snaffled one of the oranges. He tore into its soft skin and began to eat. Oh, it was exquisite. The juices just exploded in his mouth. Mmm. <gasps> He'd eaten a whole orange and he thought, well, no one will miss two. And so he reached again. His little fingers took a second orange and began to eat each segment slowly, devouring them. Oh, it was wonderful. He hadn't eaten all day. But then he realised 
He had stolen his stepmother's oranges. What would she say? What would she do? But hunger knows no shame. And so his little fingers grabbed the third orange and he ripped into the fruit, eating them whole. He was just licking his fingers clean, enjoying and savouring the last bit of flavour when BAM! Stepmother's cane slammed down on the table beside him, just narrowly missing his tiny thin shoulders. She leaned into his face. Who has stolen my oranges? She pointed her long cane like a bony finger, her dark eyes piercing at all the children that had scurried out into the room. They peeped out from behind doors and chairs, not wanting to betray their brother. And T, T was just quaking, shivering. Speak now or I will beat the truth out of you, she bellowed. He was so terrified, he pushed past her and ran out of their wooden house into the night. He ran across the fields of golden corn, sweet potato, cassava and yams. He ran and his feet carried him, sprinting, sprinting to the beat of his heart. And he ran, and he ran into the forest where darkness cloaked all around him. And as he ran, he heard a mystical breeze that was drifting in from the Caribbean Sea whispering to him, run T, run, keep on moving, run T, run, don't look back. And so he ran, and he ran, and he ran, until he finally reached a path that twisted and turned with the barks of the trees. And there was a clearing in the woods, a clearing of tall silk cotton trees slender trees that are said to be the keepers of the spirits and their secrets. In this clearing lay T's mother's grave and he threw himself down on the earth crying, sobbing, mama, mama, please help me. Mama, I'm in so much trouble all because I've stolen stepmother's oranges. He cried and he cried his body was shaking, shaking with fear. And as he cried, the forest sat watching and twitching as a single orange seed fell from T's clothes onto the ground. His tears watered the earth, watering the seed. And the seed began to swell and grow. The seed grew roots and the roots took hold into the earth and then a shoot, a little green shoot popped out from the ground. T spied the shoot, he stopped crying, he dried his eyes and he began to fill with hope. As his mother heard him, he saw this tiny tree bending and twisting T began to sing. Grow, orange tree, grow. Grow, orange tree, grow. And the tree grew and grew and soft white petals began to blossom. And so he sang some more. Blossom, orange tree, blossom. Blossom, orange tree, blossom. And beside these beautiful soft white petals, Little green oranges glistened in the sunlight. And so he sang again. Grow ripe, orange tree, grow ripe. Grow ripe, orange tree, grow ripe. And as the tree began to grow and the oranges appeared, he was overjoyed. Now he could replace stepmother's oranges. He watched as the tree began to tower above him and he thought, now let me pluck some, let me pick some. But it was too tall. And so he sang again. Bend, orange tree, bend. Bend, orange tree, bend. And the tree obeyed T's command. It lowered its branches 
dangling orange fruit like jewels glistening in the sunlight. He plucked as many as he could carry and he dashed back home where he found his siblings waiting for him. He gave each one of them an orange to eat and oh, they huddled together, smiling and joking and, and helping each other rip into the fruit. It was a delicious, beautiful moment. And then T remembered the three oranges he had taken from the bowl. He tiptoed back into the kitchen and placed them there. Now he thought he was safe. But just as he was about to turn around, T saw a dark shadow stretched over the table. He turned around and came face to face with stepmother's snarling glare. Where did those oranges come from, boy? Who put them there? And at first, he didn't answer. He was just too terrified to speak. Speak now! I, 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 I found an orange tree. I found an orange tree and picked some more for you. I just knew you were angry. I replaced your oranges. He managed to stammer out a reply. Stepmother grabbed one of the oranges, tore into its dappled skin and apes the fruit. She was absolutely stunned with surprise at the flavour. It was the sweetest orange she had ever eaten. She grabbed tea by the collar. Tell me where you got these oranges from. Now, show me. He didn't want to show her. He didn't want to take her to his mother's grave. He didn't want to share the magic with her, but he had no choice. And so he led stepmother across the fields of gold and corn sweet potato, cassava and yams. He led her into the forest where the paths twisted and turned with the barks of the trees. He showed her the clearing of silk cotton trees and there they stood amazed at the height of this orange tree. It had now doubled in size and was towering above them, shooting up into the sky. The oranges were hanging, huge, glistening. Pick one for me now, quickly, she ordered. And so T sang again. Are you ready to sing with me, everyone? Bend, orange tree, bend. Bend, orange tree, bend. And as he sang, the tree obeyed his command. It lowered its branches and T reached out and plucked one of the golden oranges. Stepmother roughly grabbed the fruit, tore into it again and chomped away. Oh, she was absolutely overjoyed and filled with greed. She wanted more. Get up there and get me some more oranges, she cried. But she couldn't be bothered to wait for him. She, she reached down, pulled at the branches and started to climb into the tree herself. And as she sat there, she, she reached out for all of the other oranges. She was just overjoyed. She couldn't wait. She tore into them. She didn't even finish eating half of them. It was as if she was in a frenzy. And T watched below as stepmother was filling filling her belly with all of this wonderful fruit. Mmm, I am going to get all of you children to pick these oranges. I can sell them, sell them in the marketplace. This is going to be my money tree, she cried. And T didn't like that idea. He didn't like the idea of her claiming his tree, claiming their future. And so an idea came to him. He began to sing. Grow, orange tree, grow. Grow, orange tree, grow. Sing with me, everyone. Grow, orange tree, grow. Grow, orange tree, grow. And of course, the tree obeyed his command. With stepmother clambering into the branches, the tree grew taller and taller, higher and higher. It burst through the clouds that hung sleepily in the sky. T watched 
but he could no longer see the top of the tree. He could no longer see his stepmother. And he continued to sing. Grow, orange tree, grow. Grow, orange tree, grow. And as he sang, that mystical Caribbean breeze stirred up once again, blowing in from the sea and mixing with the ash, twisting and turning the leaves until, quick, crack, the branches snapped and the breeze blew stepmother away. T watched, knowing that now his future was safe, safe and bright with his magic orange tree. Between the forest and the mountains of Bulgaria, on the land there is a small cottage made of wood. And in that wooden cottage, next to the hearth, there is a woman and her child. Mara, the girl is called. And you will find them sitting there, spinning, 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 speaking and laughing, crying, and singing. Dragana sejif gradina Mohammed Rahaga no dragano Gradina Pohobia trend a hill Mohammed Rahaga no dragano speaking, telling stories, singing, and always spinning. One day, one day the daughter said to the mother, Mamo, iskam do uchida na sedyanka. To go to a sedyanka, the mother said, to a gathering, to a neighbor's house, to a party. You've never asked me that before, daughter. Well, I I suppose you can, but here is his bag of tow. You must spin every single last part of the tow. If you do not, I will turn into a cow. Into a cow, might have thought. But she agreed, and so she went. She went to a sedyanka. Oh, how wonderful it was to, say, to be there with all her friends and to spin and to sing and to dance and to laugh and she span. She span as fast as she could. She span until her fingers were raw. She span until her hands were stiff. She span until her fingers bled. And she still kept on spinning, spinning and spinning. And as she was in the last distaff, the ninth distaff. Her father knocked and came to collect her. Her father who had just been to market. Her father who had finished earlier than usual. The sun hadn't quite yet set. He could hear the maidens laughing and singing. And he thought it was a little bit early, but he still went in and called for her. How could she refuse her father? She could not refuse her father. She never dared to refuse her father. And so she left and she went with him. They walked without saying a word, him carrying a bunch of leeks in his hands from the market. They knocked on the front door, but there was no open door, no greeting, no smile. Just a, a moo. The sound of a cow from inside and she knew. They knocked and they shouted and eventually the father broke down the door. And there in front, in the cool of the front room, there was a snow white cow. And Mara knew. 
She knew that she had not worked hard enough. She knew that she had not spun hard enough. And because of that, her mother, her dear mother, had turned into a cow. The husband was confused. He, he looked for his wife. But Mara did not tell him. How could she? Such shame, such guilt. From that day on, grief washed over her like a tide. Time passed, days, weeks, months. And eventually the man married another wife. Mara got a stepmother. She was nice enough. She smiled, but it was not her mother. And with that cow that stayed in the barn, Mara would nuzzle her head next to the neck of a cow and I would stay there and embrace for what seemed like hours. Heartbeat next to heartbeat. She would sing to her cow. She would laugh, but mostly she would cry. Her father and her stepmother looked. What a curious relationship with a cow. It was not natural. It was not normal. And so one day the stepmother said to her husband, husband, this cow does not produce milk. She is barren. She only eats and costs us money. Slaughter her for our dinner. Mara heard the news, the words as she was hiding behind the door. Her heart sank. What could she do? And so she chose not to be there on the day that it happened. A meal was cooked. The smell lingered across the room and the stepmother cooked joyously. And Mara was welcomed. Yash, they said. Yash, yash. Tolku vam mnogo hrana ima, yash. But she would not eat. She would look, try to hide her sorrow, but she would not eat. When all the meat was finished, she gathered all the bones and instead of throwing them to the dogs at the crossroads, she gathered them, bone and sinew, and she took them to the hearth and bone mixed with tears, she buried them deep down in the soft ash of the hearth. And she wept. So hollow was she that you could have made a drum out of her. Time passed and Mara lay by that fireplace day after day, night after night, with the bones of her mother. So much so that her name became Mara Pepelashka, Mara Cinderella. At some point in the year, on the time of weddings, there was, of course, a wedding. And everybody in the village was invited. And the stepmother and her husband they were so excited. You should come, they said to Mara. Come to the wedding. There'll be dancing. There'll be food. It'll be good for you. Look at me, she said. I am all covered in ash. My clothes, my face, my hair. What am I going to do to a wedding? You go. I'll stay here. And no matter how much convincing they went and she was left there in her usual place by the hearth. She fell asleep. She fell into a deep and dreamful sleep in which she heard the voice of her mother. Her mother telling her to go to that hearth, dig deep, Uncover the bones, and there she will find a dress. Put the dress on, said the mother, and go to the wedding. Mara woke up with a fright, her, her heart beating inside of her chest. She went to that hearth and started uncovering the bones, fingers deep inside that ash, until she saw a dress. 
a dress as golden like the sun, silver like the moon, sparkling like the stars, and shoes golden. She cleaned her face, put on her new dress, put on her shoes and, and went on the back path to the village. No one saw her. They were all at the wedding. And she entered. And as she entered, it was like the sun rose. Everyone turned to look at this girl. Who was she? And she joined the hura, that, that dance that goes round and round and led it. And people stepped back. As she danced, she was almost hovering above the ground and people sat there, stood, waited, with mouths agape. And as she watched, she knew it was time to go before her parents got there and she ran out the door. And as she ran, quickly she lost one of her golden shoes, but she had no time to go back. And she ran through the back ways and entered that cottage panting, buried the clothes back in the hearth, put cinders and put ash on her face and laid out back down the place that she knew was home. When her father and stepmother entered, they began telling her, Oh, the Znaish Kakwastana Neska, the Svadbuta the Kova Mumiche, the Kova Mumiche, the Kava Rokla, Kutu Zlatu, Kutu Slunce, Kutu Luna, Kutu Zvezdi, oh, Mali Mali, the Chikash, Kakwa Nesh to Stana, the Beshi, the Beshi Tam, the Beshi Tam. Mara said nothing. She just smiled politely. She just laughed. Mostly. She just stared a blank look. The following day, the king and his men were taking the horses out and they needed to go and water the horses. And the horse went back and started neighing. Something scared him in the water. Let me see, they said. And as they looked, they saw something golden glittering in the water. And the king wanted to go and see what it is, and he pulled a golden shoe. Look at this shoe, he said. I am the king of this land, and I do not have such shoes. I do not have such items. If this is so rich, if this is such beauty, imagine the person that was wearing it. And so he gave an order that all the women were brought to his palace in a line, one by one, to try the shoe. And so the command was given, and all the women began to come, whispering and giggling and laughing in a single line, and one by one they tried and they tried and tried, but the shoe did not fit. Has everybody come? said the king. Has there been anyone who disobeyed my rule? Everyone's here, they said, apart from a useless girl, Mara Pepelashka. She is covered in ash. She does not wash. She just stays there. A crazy girl, they say. She did not come, but it is clear it is not hers anyway. Bring her to me, said the king. And so Mara Pepelashka was brought. And as soon as she tried that golden shoe, it fit like a second skin. And the king could not believe his eyes. The dress was brought. She put it on. Oh, such beauty. Everybody gasped. This is the girl from the wedding, people would say. I will marry this girl, the king said. Mara Pepelashka, a girl without a mother, become a queen. How wonderful. No one asked her. Did she want to marry the king? She had no choice. Women had no choice in those days and so she went. There was a wedding. Oh, such a feast. Such beautiful food. Such heavy laden tables. They almost creaked from the weight, dancing and drinking, drinking and singing. Mara made a wonderful queen. 
a wise queen, a queen with kindness, with compassion. How could she not? Everything she had gone through taught her the most important lessons in life. And that king and queen in that kingdom, it is said that due to Mara the queen, that kingdom was one of the most successful, kind and just ones that time has ever known across the whole land. Once upon an ill-fated tomorrow, there was a city, infected by the sickness of greed, a desire for gold over all things. So the buildings crumbled, and the fields died as the rich grew richer and the poor poorer. On the banks of the greasy grey river, old Mother Mud sat spinning flax into yarn with her three children. The two twins, in sickness, spoke. Our bellies rumble, we have no meat. Whoever drops their spindle, we shall eat. So in silence they span, and the mother's spindle fell. No, don't eat her, eat me, please, and be well, the youngest said. The twins said, look, a nod of the head, and on they span. And the mother's spindle fell, again, and again, and once more again. Once or twice is once or twice, but thrice is thrice, and four is no more. Now you are meat. No, please, it's me you can eat. But with her own yarn, they strangled her with sharp iron carved her on a hot fire, roasted her, and piece by piece, arm and leg, they ate her. But for the next forty nights, the youngest, little muddy feet, gathered the bones, washed them in the greasy grey river, smoked them over the fire, hid them beneath a stone, and all the while they prayed. Mud and bone, ash, water, smoke and stone, let love be more powerful than greed. Mud and bone, ash, water, smoke and stone, let love be more powerful than greed. Let love be more powerful than greed. And in the last prayer of the last night, they heard their mother's voice. Love is greater. Greater than greed, plant these bones and love will see. Love is greater, greater than greed, plant my bones and love you'll see. So on the hill, overlooking the city at the source of the greasy grey river, they planted those bones for a final time. The sickly sun set, and as they slept, a green spear broke the spoil soil up, up, up to pierce the hollow sky. The sun rose on the grave, a great tree, arms wide. On the branches, a flower, rare and fine, glittering, radiant with solar lines like sun, like stars, like moon above. It floated to the ground, soft as a dove. It was a dress, like silk and yet not silk. In one pocket, seeds. In the other, gold coins. Another, 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 always filling again. Muddy feet thanked the mother tree, took the dress under their arm, set off home, arriving before the twins had woken and hiding it well. On Sunday, the twins went to the temple. The temple was... An old bank in the heart of the city where the people would gather to pray to the billionaire space gods of old. To pray for riches and wealth. As soon as they'd left, 
muddy feet, put on the dress, shining like the heavens above, and followed them into the city. The moment they entered the temple, a hush fell, filled with the rush of a thousand voices gasping as one. Muddy feet shone, too bright to behold. A billionaire, a billionaire, a billionaire, a billionaire. That was the whisper that spread like wildfire, and when muddy feet opened their mouth to speak, silence fell. Hear this. Your gods are dead. I bring you their bodies. I bring you their heads. And from their pocket, muddy feet scattered gold coins into the crowd. A thousand people dived to the ground and over the chaos, muddy feet spoke again. Hear this. My goddess is alive. Plant her. Love her. She will survive. And from the other pocket, Seeds. We don't want seed, we want gold. Give us gold, give us more. The crowd surged, chasing muddy feet from the temple, and as they ran, the dress caught and tore on a sharp wire fence, pulling away the pocket of gold and leaving a single sleeve hanging from the wire. The crowd fought and pushed and kicked and punched pulling the pocket of gold until it ripped in two, and only then was the flow of gold coins ended, and they looked around to see that muddy feet was gone. Muddy feet made their way home, the dress shriveling and drying like an old leaf, so they cast it into the fire and dressed again in rags. And just as they'd done so, just as they'd done so, the twins arrived. Muddy feet, you should have been there at the temple today. A billionaire came down for the heavens. Oh, their dress was to die for. They gave us gold coins. Look, see, you have missed out. You poor rat, you. I don't care what you picked up from the ground. You're welcome to keep it. By the temple, there was one in the crowd called Shula. And while everyone else was fighting over gold coins, Shulas was filling their pockets with seeds, because they longed to see green things growing again, and once the crowd had gone, they took the sleeve from the wire and wondered what it was, like silk and yet not silk. So they went about the city, asking everyone they could what it could be, but nobody could tell them, and eventually it had dried, dried like withering paper turning too soon to dust. So Shulis walked up the greasy grey river, dejected, looking for a solitude for their sorrow. But it wasn't solitude or sorrow they found, but wonder. There, on the hill, the tree growing, on the branches, the flower, like silk and yet not silk, and brilliant as the stars in the sky. So Shulis waited, falling asleep. The Sunday sun rose and muddy feet arrived to pick that new flower dress. Who are you? And what do you want? My name's Shulis. If you're here for the gold, take it. It means nothing to me. No, 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 look, look, look. And seeing those seeds and that anxious, kind smile Muddy Feet realised their prayers had come true. Here was a person that valued love over greed. So Muddy Feet didn't go to the temple that day, nor did they go home and they were not seen the week after that, or the week after that, and the people of the city wondered where their billionaire had got to. But in the shack by the river, the two twins were also wondering where their brat of a sibling had gone. And as that shack got filthier, they began to hunt for Muddy Feet. Muddy Feet and Shoeless were in love. Living on that shack on the hill, they built a house, planted a garden, and when they weren't tending the soil, they would walk the city streets, scattering seeds in the cracks and across the wastelands, tempting the green to grow again. But one day, the twins saw them and followed them up the greasy grey river. 
and the twins saw the house, and the twins saw the tree, and the twins saw the dress flower growing. That brat of a sibling is the billionaire. They've been keeping all their gold f the secret from us. Ah, the little liar. We ought to teach them a lesson. Night fell and a storm rolled in as the two twins crept, axes in hand, up the hill. The sound of the rain and the thunder masking the noise as they chop, chop, chopped. And the mother tree came crashing down. First, they stole the pocket of gold. Then, they broke up the branches and made a hard wooden chest. Then, they crept into the house where they found their sibling sleeping. They bound and gagged muddy feet, locking them tight inside the chest, which they dragged down to the river, pushed it into the water, and they laughed the way home. That chest, it washed out into the ocean, into a day, into a week, into a month, into a year. Muddy feet sustained by drinking the sticky sweet sap that dripped from the branches until the chest broken open on hard rocks all about a desert. No fresh water flowed, no green plants growing and their tears slow. Drop, drop, drop onto the broken branches. But where those tears fell, look there, a green shoot, a bud, a leaf, up and out, round and over. And as Muddy Feet watched, the broken branches became a circle of trees. The circle of trees became a living house. So Muddy Feet lived there, alone in the desert. And they dug a well for their water and they made a bed of soft leaves, and they planted a garden. And they were all alone. A long year ago, shoeless awoke to find muddy feet gone. And their tears too dropped onto the broken trunk of the mother tree. But where those tears fell, a voice. Raise me up and roll me down into the river safe and sound. Oh, raise me up and roll me down into the river safe and sound. Into the river safe and sound. And when that broken trunk touched the water of the river, a bud, a leaf, a shoot, up, out, round, over, up, out, round, over, as they watched, that broken trunk became a living ship with a great mast of a tree trunk, great wide leaves for sails. And the people of the city, they all came out to watch the living ship as it sailed away. The two twins... The two twins were gleeful. With riches beyond counting, they scented themselves in fine perfumes, dressed in the best of clothes, and built a mansion where their crooked shack had once stood. And for a while, all was well. Until... Where... Have you hidden the pocket of gold? Oh, fair twin of mine, me, it's you who's always hiding it. Last time we lost it, it was in your room. Because you put it there, you're trying to feign me. It's mine, 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 mine. And so they bickered and fought and took the pocket of gold and pulled back forth, back forth, back forth until it went up and out and down through the window and into the greasy grey river. And there it caught fast on a branch. And the coins began to flow. Another, 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 another. 
and the river began to fill with gold coins. There was so much gold, it soon became worthless. The gold sickness was broken. The city was healed. And the people looked around and began to realise they had to help one another. To replant the fields and the trees, to rebuild the buildings, to clean the greasy waters of the river and make life good again. And so that's what they did. But there were two in that city who could not change. The two twins lived alone in the empty mansion beside the Gold River, where they grew thinner and meaner, hungrier and crueler. Until one day, We are hungry, fair twin of mine, one of us should eat. Give yourself to me, for I am the eldest. Eldest by two seconds. I'm the tallest. Tallest by two inches. I'm the cleverest. If you were cleverer, we'd have food to eat by now. And so they bickered. From bickering to fighting to kicking to punching to scratching to spitting until they had no strength left. And as they lay on the floor, one of them took the other by the foot and began to eat gnawing and biting, bit by bit, bite by bite, and the other did the same. And the two twins consumed one another. Shoeless rescued Muddy Feet, and they travelled back across the ocean, back through a year, a month, a week and a day, to find the city growing green again. The streets were filled with laughter and music and love. And the wild wastelands rang with the sound of blackbirds in the thickets, skylarks on the wing. But on the banks of the Golden River, there was a mansion abandoned that no one ever entered. And inside that mansion sat on two piles of gold that no one would ever spend were two bodiless heads cursing one another alone for all eternity. To eat our mother is to eat ourselves. Bark and root, branch and bone, my tale is told, my lips are sown. My song is sung, and now I'm done. Once there was a woman who wished for a child. She went to another place, a place some call dream. She raised her eyes to the mountain, planted her feet on the ground, listened to the rustle of the leaves, smelt blossoms bleeding fragrance down on the wind that kissed her skin. And then words came, repeated over and over and over again until the sense leached out, but the power remained power the goddess heard and sent a plum blossom portent and then sent a gift. The gift was a daughter, Hannah, more beautiful than any flower, more precious than any jewel. Once there was a girl who knew that she was an answer to prayer, a miracle, a gift from the goddess of compassion herself because her mother told her every single day she loved to hear it. Mother and daughter together planted an all year round flowering garden in thanks to the goddess for each other. But one day, the mother fell ill. One day she closed her eyes and did not open them again. And Hannah's world went gray. She looked out onto that garden throughout the year as the snowdrops gave way to the plum blossoms 
to the cherry blossoms, the camellias, the irises of early summer, the chrysanthemums, and then everything erupt in red maple. But it was as if everything was grey paper. And then, before a year was out, before she could draw breath, because her grandparents said it would be a fine idea, one day her father came back home with another woman. This is my new wife, your new mother, he said. The new mother had a big smile and capable hands and absolutely no interest in frivolous flowers. A girl should be kept busy doing useful things. And so she had Hannah fetch, carry, sew, mend, iron, servant's work. She tried to bear it as best she could, with no outward show of resentment. But sometimes she failed, an eye roll here, a sigh there. But it always seemed as if the new mother was there, ready to witness those transgressions and make sure everybody else knew about it as well. Ah, oh, Hannah, now there's a one. I'm sure it's nothing to do with her late mother's parental incompetencies that she's uh, rude and incompetent herself. She's just grieving. I'm sure we'll get along just fine in the end. Perfectly reasonable. If she'd had Hannah's best interests at heart. But this is a Cinderella story. And this is a wicked stepmother. She did not. She was waiting for the seeds of divide and conquer to take root nice and firmly in fertile ground. When they did, she sent the father away on a business trip. She sent the servants off on errands and then she called Hannah to her and she said, this is my house now, not yours. You must leave, take her away. And that's how Hannah found herself all alone at dusk on a mountainside far from home with absolutely no idea what to do. Uncontrollable tears fell. And then the shadows lengthened. The owls started hooting. And her tears dried and turned into cold sweat. Night fell. The moon rose over the mountain and cast its shadow over her. And then... She did the only thing she could do. She remembered her mother. She went to another place, a place some call dream. She fixed her eyes on the mountain, planted her feet on the ground, listened for the leaves, smelt the blossoms, bleeding fragrance down on the wind that kissed her skin. Words came, repeated over and over and over and over and over again until the sense leached out, but the power remained. In other words, she prayed. And that's what the mountain heard. That's what the mountain answered. There was light. There was warmth. There was rest. A huge hand light placed on the top of Hannah's head. And then there was a face, lined and craggy as the mountainside. The face of an old woman. Out of the face came a voice. Here. You may not stay. You must be on your way. Over the mountain, upstream of a south flowing river to where a plume of smoke denotes a place of welcome. Here, take this, wear it. It will keep you safe. Remove it only when you are in a place where your voice rings true in the heart of one whose voice rings as true in yours. Now, go, go well. Blinking in the morning, Hannah looked at the mountain's gift in her hands, a long object that looked like a piece of bark, but it wasn't a piece of bark. It was a skin, an old woman's skin lined and craggy as the mountain side itself, with just enough room inside it for Hannah. She put it on. It was soft and still like a mother's embrace. And she set off, 
over the mountain, along that south flowing river. The skin, as promised, kept her safe, so safe that it was as if, as an old woman, she was completely invisible. No one could see her at all. Big change for a girl, more beautiful than any flower, more precious than any jewel, but Hannah bore it well. And she never forgot to give thanks to the mountain for giving her everything she had now. Then she saw the plume of smoke. She followed it and at its source, she raised her eyes to the mountain, planted her feet, listened. And then words came over and over and over again until the sense leached out, but the power remained. In other words, she prayed. And that's what the young master of the house, young Takayoshi, in his apartments, heard. A voice, rich and deep as a temple bell. It drew him all the way through the house to the entrance where an old woman was standing, face lined and craggy as the mountainside, standing, asking for a job. In that voice, something shifted in him. We must hire this woman immediately. The other staff of the household were not delighted about that. No one this old could be of any help, really. But the young master gets what the young master wants. They welcomed Hannah in. They gave her a job, tending the fire, an easy job, cooking the rice. And that's how Hannah found herself in this new household, this new situation. She kept herself to herself, head down. And perhaps that's why she didn't notice Takayoshi hanging on her every word. Perhaps that's why she didn't notice the servants, the other servants notice that Takayoshi was hanging on her every word and wonder what witchcraft is this? that makes an old woman so attractive and interesting to such a young man. This is no ordinary old woman. She's a strangely straight back, a strange lack of good old days stories. We must watch her. Perhaps that's why she didn't see every night after everyone had gone to bed, Takayoshi follow her outside and watch her as she raised her face to the mountain and gave thanks. Until one night, Takayoshi, in his usual place, saw her not only raise her face, but reach inside it and pull the skin right down. Then she heard him gasp. First, a gasp of fear, but then when he saw what was underneath, a gasp of another kind entirely. He rushed over. He took her by the hands. I knew it. You are an angel in disguise sent to me by the gods. Take off that skin, take my hand, take my heart. I am yours. Two pairs of bright young eyes saw each other for the first time. But Hannah, this is my home, this skin. To be removed only when I am in a place where my voice rings true in the heart of one whose voice rings as true in mine. If that is you, if that is your voice, you will marry me as I am in this skin. The next morning, early the next morning, Takayoshi went to his parents' apartments and told them that he wanted to marry the old woman who tends the fire in the household or spend the rest of his life as a monk. What? You must be joking. That woman, she's a servant. And what's more, she's twice our age, let alone yours. Do you know what you're saying? You must be joking. Tell us you're joking. You're not joking. Fine. Have it your way. Marry this woman. You'll regret it. And so, with his parents' consent, if not their blessing, Takayoshi went to Hana, took her by the hand and proposed marriage to her in the old woman's skin. And she said yes. On the wedding day, an awkward wedding day with uneasy guests and unhappy parents, Hannah lifted her veil and there was not an old woman, but a young one, about exactly the same age as Takayoshi. 
unease turned to, to celebration. <laughs> the parents were so relieved that when Hannah insisted on planting an all year round flowering garden in thanks to the mountain for sending her there, all over their farmland, they did not complain. So relieved that when Hannah insisted that the old woman of the mountain lay at the head of all the deities on the family shrine, they were fine with that too. And then, some time later, when it was discovered that her family were of a higher social status than his, and so he would be taking her name and not she, his, they were fine with that too. Some time later, Hannah's father found her. The new mother ran away before Hannah could forgive her, which she would have done. And the two, husband and wife, raised their faces to the mountain in gratitude. For now, they'd found home in each other. The forests in Russia are wide and deep and blue. My great-great-grandmother came from one of those forests and when I was a child I went perhaps to visit her. And in her little cottage in those forests I met another woman. And this woman was full. She was so steeped in her own existence that it felt as if nothing had been left out. And one evening I asked her how it was that she was so free and yet so here. And she said it hadn't always been like that. And then she told me this story. When my mother turned into a sheep, she said, we were in the woods. One of our flock had slipped out of an open gate on an early morning and the morning was thick with mist and we walked through the woods to try and find that sheep and my mother tripped over a tree root and fell down over rocks and broke her neck. But instead of staying, instead of fading away with her broken body, she opened up doors in time and space that she hadn't known existed and came into the body of the sheep so that she could stay with me. My sheep mother and I went back to my father and I told him what had happened but he didn't believe me. He called men and they went into the woods and they spent three days searching for the body and they found nothing, as if it had gone or been taken. A few months later, a woman came into the village whose face at some angles looked like my mother and my father married her. And she brought into the cottage cruelty and silence and a daughter who didn't speak. I don't need to tell you about the smoke of loneliness that moved up then into my chest, or about the house and how the keeping of it had been my mother and father and I, and now it was just me, or about how my stepmother looked after her silent daughter and gave her all she wanted, and, and I just became dirtier and dirtier with all of the chores and the ash and the dust or how even that wasn't enough. And my stepmother watched me when I slipped out at every moment I could to be in the sheep pen with my mother. And one day she looked at my father and she said, we should kill that black sheep before winter comes. And my father looked at me askance and he said, who'd never forgiven me. My father looked at me askance. He'd never forgiven me for bringing back nonsense in the space of my mother. And he said, yes, perhaps it's best or how I went out that night into the sheep pen and I put my arms around my mother and I screamed and I howled as if I could break the very barriers of time itself. Or how I heard a footfall then and I turned and I saw her, the daughter who didn't speak, Riga. But she opened her mouth and she said to me, 
Why do you make that sound? If you cry like that, they will send you away. And I looked at her and I said, tomorrow your mother will kill my mother and then I will be all alone. And she said, no, they will kill her, but you will not be alone. Not if you do what I tell you. Tomorrow they will kill her. They will make stew and soup from her blood and flesh, eat none of it. But in the evening, when they're sleeping, gather the bones of your mother and bury them in the woods and then she will stay with you. I wiped my eyes with my greasy hands and I looked at her and I said, how do you know this? And she said, my mother is a witch and I am her daughter. So the next day they killed my mother, but I didn't eat any of her flesh or her blood. And in the evening when they were asleep, I knelt on that dusty floor and I gathered, I sought for all of the bones that they'd thrown on the ground. And Riga knelt with me and we found together every bone from the smallest to the largest. And then I took those bones into the forest and I buried them. And the next day, a sapling grew. And when the moon rounded, a great silver birch. After that, things in the house were different. The next day I sat down at the spinning wheel and Riga sat down next to me and began to card the wool as if from speaking she'd somehow allowed herself to move in the house. And I met her eyes and we looked at each other. And then in the afternoon, when I took the big wooden bucket and began to wash the clothes, she came and did it with me. And after that, we began to hold the house together and the hearth brightened a little. And sometimes we even laughed together. And I realized that her eyes were like two April moons and her voice was like a song I'd only just remembered. My stepmother watched us and bided her time. And her time came when there was an invitation to the prince's ball. And of course, you know what happened. She took Riga, she took her to the market. She bought the most expensive clothes that she could with the money from my father's wool and me, she gave nothing. And in the evening, that evening of the ball, she looked at me and she said, you're too filthy to come to a ball. And then she took barley and she took ash and she mixed them together and she stirred them around with her foot. And she said, stay here and separate that barley from the ash. And then when you've done that, you can dance. But Riga said, no. No, if she has to stay here in the dust, then I will not dance with the nobles or the dukes. If you make her stay here on the floor, then I will crawl underneath the prince's table and I will suck the meat from the bones they throw on the floor. My stepmother said, you will not, you will dance. They left the house still arguing. But me, I wanted to go to the ball. I went out of that house to my mother's grave and I knelt down on the soil and I wept and I wept for so long I could no longer hear the sound of my own tears only the sound in the leaf above and then I heard a voice and the voice said wash yourself on one side of the birch dry yourself on the second and dress yourself on the third so I washed myself in a stream on one side of the birch I dried myself in the green leaves and on the third side of the birch, there was a dress of white and gold and silver and a horse, a white horse with a golden mane. And I put on that dress of white and silver. And then I took a branch from the birch tree and I went back to my house and I struck that branch three times on the hearth and the barley and the ash sprung apart from each other. And then I got on the horse and I rode to the ball. And as I was riding, I was thinking about Riga and I was thinking I would find her and I would tell her that I was okay and that maybe we could dance. But when I got there, I hadn't realized how everyone would stare at me or how they would part for me. And at the center of that parting would be the prince and how he, walk, he walked towards me and he put out his hand and he asked me to dance. The prince asked me to dance. I looked for Riga, I did, but there were so many people in that ballroom and I danced with the prince once and then he asked me again. And I danced until I saw the full moon rising above the castle walls. 
And then I bowed to him and I pulled away and a golden ring fell from my finger. And as it fell, I thought, she will find it. She will know that I was here and that I was safe. How would she know? She was a witch's daughter. She would know. But when they came back, when I put the dress back to the birch tree and it had sunk into the soil, when they came back by the hearth, I was sitting and my stepmother said, Riga danced all night with the prince. And I wanted to say, no, that was me. But I didn't. And I looked at Riga, but she wouldn't meet my eye and she said nothing. And the next day, it was the same thing. My stepmother poured oats into ash and told me to stay. Riga said that without me, she would not dance. I went to the birch tree, I got a dress and I went to the ball. And again, I looked for her, but there was the prince and the prince asked me to dance. And there was such a look in people's eyes when they looked at me that I hadn't seen since my mother had been alive. And I danced with the prince. And I looked at the way they looked at me and I danced with that music and I waited until I saw the moon rising outside the castle walls and then I bowed to him and I pulled away and a bangle fell from my wrist and I thought she will find it, she will know. The next night my stepmother poured milk, ash into the milk and I went to the birch tree, they went to the ball, again I dressed in white and silver and gold and I rode and I danced with the prince and as I was leaving a slipper fell from my foot and I thought she will find it. She will know that it was okay and she can dance. But of course she didn't find it. It was the prince. The prince went round all the houses looking for me. And when he finally came to our house, my stepmother pushed me into the ashes and she did something to Riga's foot that made the blood drain from her face. And then she pushed that slipper on to Riga's foot and it fitted. And my stepmother said, she is your bride. After that, everything was a blur. My stepmother was getting things ready for Riga to go, but Riga said something to the prince that I didn't hear. And then we went out into the courtyard. And as they were there on that horse waiting to go, she put out her hand and she pulled me up behind her. And then she said to the prince, go, go. And we left. We rode out of our gate into the path of the forest. And as we were on that forest path, Riga said to the prince, ride, ride, for I am not your bride. By oak and ash and collared dove, behind me sits the girl you love. Ride, ride, for I am not your bride. Behind me sits the girl of ash and she will wear the bridal sash. Ride, ride on, for my stepmothers would switch us around and I can change us back. But it's in times of change that she has her greatest power and she will come after us. Ride on. So we rode on through the forest and I could hear the stepmother coming after us, but suddenly the earth buckled and broke and in front of us where there'd never been before, there was a rushing river. And Riga said to the prince, ride on. And he said, if I ride through that river, we will drown. And Riga said, you must. And then she slipped from the horse's back and she knelt down on the bank of that river. I thought she was going to jump in, but instead her body shifted and changed and stretched and she turned into a wooden bridge across the river and the prince and I rode across and as soon as we were across the river I turned to slip down from the horse and shake that bridge, shake her back into girl again but it was gone. There was nothing, no river and no bridge. The prince and I rode to the castle and the next day we were married. And in the evening, he looked at me and he said, your heart is broken. And I said, yes. And he said, I will be kind to you. And I said, yes. And he was kind and he was gentle, but I couldn't be still. And every morning I went to the castle gate and I looked through it. And every morning it was locked until one day it wasn't. And like that sheep, so many moons ago, I slipped from the unlocked gate into the forest. And there in the forest, I looked from dawn until dusk. I looked in every part of the forest for the river and the bridge across it, but it wasn't there. And I ended up at my mother's grave and I knelt in the earth and I said, mother, forgive me for I have danced the wrong dance and I have told the wrong story and I wept until I could no longer hear the sound of my own tears, only the voice in the leaves above. And the voice said, 
wash yourself on one side of the tree, dry yourself on the second and dress yourself on the third. So I wash myself on one side, I dry myself on the second and on the third there was no dress, there was a skin. And I put that skin on and I felt my body begin to flow and shift and change and my feet became hooves and my skin became velvet and I walked into the forest as a deer. Oh, the bliss to no longer have human skin, to feel the earth beneath my hooves, to feel the moon in my skin. I found a herd. I walked with them. We looked for roots and we looked for shoots but I was always, always looking for the bridge across the river that wasn't there. Maybe that was what made me findable, for the prince wanted to find me. He looked everywhere, but he knew it was magic. And he knew that there was only one person he knew of that did magic. He didn't do it lightly. But after three moons, he went to that cottage that my stepmother had taken, and he told her what had happened. And in the dark of the moon, when my skin was loose around myself from dreaming, they came with torches and they took my skin from me. And the first thing I knew was the smell of my own skin scorching in their fire. And I stood up and I was naked and I wrapped my arms around myself. And the prince put out his hand to me and he said, I found you. And I looked behind him to my stepmother and I said, she will eat me. He said, no, I will keep you safe. I said, I do not want you to. And then I changed. I may not have been a witch's daughter, but my mother had been a human, a birch tree and a sheep, and I had change making in my cells. So I changed. I changed to call her. I changed not to a deer, but into the wooden bucket that we'd used to wash the clothes. And I called to her and I said, come back. I couldn't hold it. I fell back again to girl and the two of them were there waiting and I changed again to the carding comb that we used to card the wool and I called to her. And then I fell back again to girl and they were waiting and then I changed again to spinning wheel. And this time I called to her and I said, I will stay like this. I will stay as a spinning wheel. If you come back from bridge, come back from bridge, be girl again, be girl. And I felt something move like the turning of the wheel. And when I stood before them again, I was naked, but this time I didn't care because I saw in the direction of the rising sun coming towards us, a girl with eyes like two April moons and splinters in her hair. And she came towards me and she touched me on my neck. And as she did, my skin again began to shift and change and my feet became hooves and my skin became velvet. And Riga looked at my stepmother and she said, in change you have come into her life and in change you will go out of it. You have no more power over her. And then I looked at my stepmother with the eyes of a deer and I saw that she was nothing, that what she was had been so long forgotten and scorned that she had wrapped cruelty and maliciousness and other people's skins around herself so that she would not get lost. But when these were gone, there was nothing left. So it was just Riga and I and the prince in the woods. And the prince looked at me and his eyes were angry, but they were also full of wonder. And I looked at him and I realized that I did love him and that the story now was his to tell, that maybe he would go back to his castle to find another bride more beautiful, more suitable and raise children and wield a kingdom. Or maybe he wouldn't. And maybe in a couple of months he would walk the deer paths into the woods to see what would happen. In that moment, he let the anger go from his eyes and bowed to us. And then he left. And Riga put her hand again on my shoulder and the two of us, woman and deer, walked into the birch trees underneath the full April moon. And when the old woman in the forest had finished telling me that story, she put her hand on my shoulder and I looked at her and I saw inside her more shapes than I thought was possible to see in any human being. She went back inside and I stayed sitting out underneath the full moon.
Yakibud Yakinabud. In the faraway desert provinces of Sistan and Balochistan on the border of Pakistan, there once lived a little girl, Ma Pishuni. But everyone in the village called her Little Ma. And Little Ma, Little Moon, she was enamored with her teacher. There was once a teacher, Mola Baji, who was a sharp-witted and intelligent woman. And she was fascinated by the gifts that Little Ma would bring for her every day. She made a few inquiries and found that Little Ma's father was a wealthy merchant, a very kind-hearted man, and him she found to her liking. Little Ma was so thrilled when Mola Baji paid her special attention and she would answer all kinds of questions. Why, do, why does dew fall on the plants? Why do the birds sing? Why is the sky so blue? And once in a while, Mullah Bhaji would let little Ma inside her big black chador. It was like a tent where little Ma would imagine the stars twinkling in the night and the desert winds telling stories. Her mother never wore a chador and her mother was always telling her to make herself clean, comb her hair before she went to school, this, that and the other. So one day, when Mullah Bhaji suggested to little Ma that when her mother went down to the cellar, little Ma should push her into the vat of vinegar, little Ma did so. And after the 40-day mourning period, when Mullah Bhaji suggested to little Ma that she should perhaps talk to her father about getting a new mother for little Ma, little Ma did so. And soon, she had a new mother, Mola Baji. Everything was fine the first few months. But then Mola Baji had her own child. And something in her heart turned. Her tongue was a whip. And the father, he began to absent himself on his journeys for longer and longer till he was just a ghostly presence in the house. Life was not the same for little Ma again. Of course, there was no more school. And from dawn to dusk, there was just cleaning, incessant cleaning. Cleaning the stables, cleaning the tandoor, the oven, the ashes, cleaning the clothes. It was exhausting. One day, Mullah Bhaji went down to the cellar. And there, her mouth fell open in astonishment because there was a great big fat yellow cow. She was so astonished, she didn't even ask why, but a cow was wealth. And little Ma had one more chore. Take her out to the fields and make sure you don't slacken. Here, there are these three bags of cotton wool for you. Spin them into fine thread or else. She didn't need to finish. And so more, little Ma, she went to the field while the cow grazed. She picked up some sticks that she had seen older women do and tried to pull some kind of thread. But by the time the sun was in the sky, high up there, it was useless. And then, no, the cow had munched down a whole bag of cotton balls no, she said, but the cow, it approached her and began to nuzzle her neck. Such love, she began to giggle. And then she started laughing as the cow let out one explosive fart. And soft cotton thread began to emerge from her backside. She was shitting malmal thread. Just then the wind arrived and the two other sacks were blown by the wind into a well and little Ma, she felt the cow's voice in her ear. Don't worry, little Ma. Follow my instructions. Following the cow's instructions, little Ma went down that dark well till the darkness was so thick she could have cut it with a knife. In just that moment, 
she heard the soft gurgling of a stream not too far. And she splashed down onto the stream and walked where the stream would lead her. And there was a forest of acacia and chinar trees and an old raggedy hut with an old, old woman sitting there scratching and muttering at herself in irritation. Now, as the cow had instructed, Little Ma saw a comb next to the woman and she picked it up. Granny, she said, let me. And she began to gently comb the old woman's knots out of her hair. Cockroaches, earworms, crickets, frogs jumped out of that tangle. But little Ma, she continued, there, Granny, she said, there, there, there. And when it was finally done, the old woman's hair gleamed like moonlight. Now you sit there, Granny, I'm going to do some cleaning up. And little Ma did what she was used to. She cleaned up the whole house and she found a pile of jewels, rubies and diamonds and pearls, but the greatest treasure, her two bags of cotton balls. She picked them up. Thank you, Granny. Ah, little Ma, said the Granny. Where are you going in such a rush? Rest a while. Go to the edge of my garden and there you will see a frothing river as silver as my hair. Bathe in it. Nourish yourself, child. Little Ma slid into those waters and oh, she could feel the dirt cleansed. And her skin felt so soft. She came out and looked at her reflection and she had a moon on her forehead. She was moonlit forehead, Ma Pishuni. And on her chin was a little twinkling star. But little Ma remembered her stepmother. She tied a chador around her face. And that evening, when Mola Bhaji looked at little Ma up and down, Mother, you said I'm an adult now. Look, I can spin. And she showed her the threads. Mola Bhaji couldn't understand it. No matter how much little Ma worked all day with the cow and at night she cleaned everything by the dark. There was no fire, there was no light, but she seemed to get everything done. And she was growing and she was glowing. <sighs> One night, Mola Bhaji watched Ma Pishuni, and she saw a light in the stables. The little thief, she said, she's stolen some light. And she barged in on Ma Pishuni. Her mouth dropped in astonishment. The stable was bathed in moonlight and the light came from Ma Pishuni's forehead, the crescent moon. How did this happen? Where did you get this? What have you been doing? She thrashed the girl and the story spilt out. That cow, that cow, anger consumed Mola Bhaji. It withered her. It sickened her from inside. She couldn't bear to see her daughter looking so ordinary next to Ma, who was glowing, ethereal. And finally, Mola Bhaji took to her bed, sick. She couldn't get up. Her voice was frail. And her husband asked her, my dear wife, what can I do? What do you need? The meat, the meat of that cow, she said, that meat. Ma Pishuni had not cried as much in all her life. She begged her father, give her any meat. Just why must it be this cow? I'm sorry, my daughter. I'm so sorry, but I can't bear to see another daughter become motherless. And that night, 
Mahapishini slept with her arms around the great big cow mother. She felt the cow whisper into her ear, do not eat my meat, Mahapishini, do not eat my meat. Bury my bones, Mahapishini, bury my bones. And that's what she did the next day. She buried those bones deep into the ground. She sang over it. And for the first time, she felt the loss of a mother. And time passed. There was going to be a wedding in the village. And the prince himself was going to come to attend the wedding. The entire village was agog with excitement. Uh-uh, you're not coming. Maybe, maybe. If you can fill this vase with your tears and, oh, look at those beans and wheat and sand all mixed up. Maybe you can clean that and then come to the wedding. And with that, Mola Bhaji was gone with her daughter. By now, Mahapishini was just so exhausted. She, she didn't even have any tears to fill half of us. She just sat there. Mahapishani, Mahapishani, Mahapishani. She saw the chickens come out of their coop and start separating the beans and the grains and the oldest chicken stood there fluffing herself in front of Ma saying, you shall go to the ball. Go to the stable and you will find what you will find. Oh, as far as the vase is concerned, just fill it with some water and salt and that should be done. But remember to be back by midnight. Don't ask me why, just be back. Ma Pishini had not laughed or sung for a long time. And at that wedding, when she entered with her velvet red dress and golden slippers, she shone brighter than any full moon. And when she left at midnight, she left a prince longing to meet her one more time and one golden slipper. And the next morning, the soldiers wandered the village. They came to Malabaji's house and the cocks started crowing. Kukkurukkuru, kukkurukkuru, ma pishuni thane thanur, ma pishuni is in the oven. Oh, the cocks have grown mad today. But madam, what is in that oven? Asked the commander. And that was that. When they opened the oven, there was a young girl covered in ash and dung, but the moon on her forehead shining. And the slipper fitted perfectly. There was a grand wedding. The prince loved his new bride so much. But she always looked at him with sad eyes and she said, I can't, I can't begin our married life until I have got my mother's blessing. I must do this alone. And the prince agreed. She found herself in the field with the grave of the cow. And she began to moisturize it with her tears. As her tears fell on that grave, the ground shuddered. And Mahapishuni saw the great big cow mother standing in front of her. Oh, you're back. Ah, my child, my child, look at you. You have grown. You have passed tests that even you're not aware of. But you have one more test. Take the dagger that the prince gave you and separate my flesh from my skin. No, shh. You can do this. As Ma Pishuni began her tasks, the cow mother lay down on the field and a great sandstorm with howling winds began to circle them, veiling what was happening inside. And Ma Pishuni, she felt nothing. She continued with her task decisively carefully and oh 
so tenderly till finally the knife and the hand and the wind and her love they were all one she only felt the rising and falling of the breath of the cow and finally when that breath stilled the wind died down and the desert sand covered the body mapishini began to blow away the sand and there arose her long dead mother rose in front of her and mapishini ran into the embrace that warm tent of an embrace and as she breathed the long forgotten smells of motherhood mapishini knew she was finally finally home this story weaves through us all child ash goes to the ball a mother who is cruel and me this traveling tale to you we sing this traveling tale to you we bring this story weaves through our souls earth grows dark and the beach grows tall and a mother lives on in the dream this traveling tale to you we sing this traveling tale to you we bring this story weaves through my mind the mothering that we hope to find it grows like a tree traveling tale to you we sing this traveling tale to you we bring this story we strew our souls through blood and ripped and bone and soil and it speaks of a bond between all things this traveling tale to you we sing this traveling tale to you we bring This story weaves through our souls. Small black child, no one cares at all. Runs from a mother for stealing food. This traveling tale to you we sing. This traveling tale to you we bring. This story weaves through our souls. An upturned boat to hold to call. Grandmother sea with eyes so green. This traveling tale. we sing this traveling tale to you we bring this story we strew our souls a coat of musk guides us to the pool from a mother who was wise and keen this traveling tale to you we sing this traveling tale to you we bring this story we strew our souls Twin to what so cruel and wrong and a city that grows good and green this traveling tale to you we sing this traveling tale to you we bring
in this very town, just on that hill over there, a young girl with a lazy left eye lived with her mother, father and two older brothers. When she was seven years old, the year a great hurricane hit this town, Left Eye's mother sat her down in the bathroom and she told her that she had found a lump in her breast. It's an illness called cancer, she said, and she let Left Eye come and feel it. But we caught it early, she said. And Left Eye resolved that from that moment she would be good and that she would make her mother well. And Left Eye grew into a tall girl and she learnt to cook and she cooked and cooked to make her mother well. Left Eye's father was an inventor and one day he became quite rich and the family moved away from the seaside into a large house with many stairs. Left Eye's brother met a girlfriend and she came to live with them. Left Eye did not get on well with her. The girlfriend was many things that Left Eye was not. And the girlfriend would express a great rage by screaming and running along the corridors and slamming the door. And the girlfriend had a sister who would often come and visit and they would lie together on the sofa for hours chatting in their mother tongue while Left Eye cooked and cooked to make her mother well. Now Left Eye's mother knew something about the girlfriend that she did not for the girlfriend had been rejected by her own mother in a faraway country at a very tender age. And Left Eye's mother grew to care very much for her son's girlfriend, who became her daughter-in-law. And the daughter-in-law grew to love her mother-in-law very much indeed. And Left Eye grew and her food became more rich and delicious and she started to grow hips and breasts and she started to find that being good became very difficult indeed. And Left Eye's mother grew distant and critical and Left Eye started to hide things from her, her joy, her passions, her longing. And the mother hid from the daughter that she was dying. As soon as she came of age, Left Eye followed a long cherished dream she had and she flew far away to the tropical rainforests of the Amazon. She was thrilled by the beauty of the wild animals that she saw there. She saw pink river dolphins and tarantulas and scarlet macaws and she saw the toucan. And at night she saw fireflies and she heard the rich liquid sound of the rainforest. And she found herself in many lonely bedrooms with men she barely knew. Men who smelt her naivety and who gave her the white powder from the coca leaf to take away her inhibitions. Just as she was coming back from the deepest part of the jungle, Left Eye received a message that said, come home now. And with a creeping dread of just how very far away from good she had been, Left Eye landed back home and three days later, her mother died. Left Eye had not saved her. And with a heart frozen, she watched as her sister-in-law draped in black, tended to the flowers in her mother's garden. Just three weeks later, Left Eye packed her bags and moved far north to, to study in a city, a city full of poets with a castle on a hill. And she was really excited to meet new friends and forget about what had just happened. But not long after she arrived, she received a phone call from her father. He had met a new wife and she had a daughter who was the same age as Left Eye. Her father was giddy with new love and every time he spoke to Left Eye on the telephone, he would tell her something of how wonderful and talented his new wife's daughter was. And Left Eye resolved that she would make this new mother love her. And for a while, Left Eye's plan seemed to be working. 
The stepmother was warm and welcoming, and whenever left I went to visit, she would cook the most delicious food. But one day it changed. Left Eye's father and stepmother threw a great family party to celebrate the engagement of the younger brother. Left Eye had spent hours cooking huge, delicious sweet onion tarts. But after the party, the stepmother heard a whisper of disapproval from somebody in the family. Nobody knows who it was, but someone said something that went straight to the cracks in her heart. For the stepmother had known the cruelest separation from her own mother at a very tender age. The stepmother had known an oppression so cruel that the shame of it lay heavy on them all. And Left Eye was the first to be accused. Left Eye's father shouted insults with a blazing fury at Left Eye accusing her of things that she knew she had never said. And from that moment onwards, the stepmother would find insult in every look and every word. And every member of the family was accused of insulting her. And at the insult of being accused of an insult, the family visited no more. Left Eye did not completely give up on the stepmother, but hedging her bets, she decided to look for another mother. Left Eye met a handsome, charming and very clever man whose mother was loving and warm and generous. Left Eye adored her and she cooked the most delicious food whenever Left Eye went to stay. Left Eye married this man and she set about being the most perfect wife and daughter she could possibly be. For seven years, Left Eye read nothing but her husband's favourite books. And for seven years, Left Eye learnt to draw and paint pictures in a way that would please her husband and mother-in-law. And for seven years, Left Eye wore nothing but clothing that her husband liked to see her in. Left Eye believed every word her husband said until one day she completely forgot that she had any words of her own. Her husband would say things like, you're not hungry, you don't want to eat, when Left Eye knew that she was hungry and she did want to eat. And this hunger made Left Eye angry and this anger made her husband cruel. So Left Eye spent many lonely hours walking by herself. And one day, Left Eye was walking along the river when she saw the flash of a kingfisher, flash, and she followed, flash, and followed, flash, until she came to an enormous pink hawthorn tree. And the tree sang to her a low buzzing song of ancient summers. And Left Eye's vision started to go strange. She started to see turquoise and deep pink everywhere she looked. And she heard the whispers of the other motherless daughters. And they said, no one tells us what to do anymore. And Left Eye walked further and further into this green landscape. And there she met a man who lived in a wood where the trees had faces and dragons flew in the canopy. And this man had enormous hands and an enormous smile. And he said to Left Eye, if you come with me, I will show you a love like you have never known. And Left Eye packed her bag secretly while her husband was at work and she ran off to be with this man who gave her so much pleasure. Her body ached and her mind blew like falling may blossoms. And after about a week or so of ecstasy, she woke with a terror. She was all alone with a man who she wasn't even sure was of this world. 
she had to get away. She had to get away from his spell. So she packed her bags and she decided she would go and visit her father's house once more. But when she got there, she saw blood and smashed glass everywhere. There had been a huge argument. There was a smashed photograph of her mother on the floor and she picked it up and put it in her bag. Her father had blood dripping from his forehead, and he, trying to laugh, saying, really, it's nothing serious. Left eye scrubbed the blood off the floor. Her stepmother had been taken to hospital, so Left Eye went to visit her. And she said thank you to Left Eye for visiting, but when her own daughter arrived, she gave Left Eye a smile which seemed to say, off you go now. Looking for somewhere safe, Left Eye packed her bags again and she decided she would go and visit her brother. He was living far across the ocean in the island with a hummingbird and the scarlet ibis. Left Eye travelled far across the ocean and she cooked delicious cakes for her niece and nephew. And she saw the toucan again in silhouette. But her brother was more distant than ever, even angry with her. And just as she was leaving, he told her of the bitter secrets of his childhood, of the things that could never be spoken of, of the shame that lay heavy on them all. And with a heaviness in her heart, Left Eye travelled back to England. And she moved into a small room on the edge of a field in Sussex. And in her sleep, old dreams came back to visit. And sometimes in the day, her thoughts were so frightening that they raced across the downs to Beachy Head. And she wondered, what would it be like to just leap? And just at that moment, the song of a nightingale burst through the hedgerow. The rich, liquid sound of the rainforest. And Left Eye followed and followed until she was so close she could see the bird in the thorny bush. And the song was so loud it ripped through time. It was a song of deception and grief, of mocking and longing. A song of joy and passion and the beauty that awaited her. The very next day, Left Eye phoned up her godmother in Brighton, an old friend of her mother's. Darling, come to Brighton right away, she said, and Left Eye packed her bags and she did. And in that town, Left Eye started to speak. And as she started to speak of the things that could never be spoken of, she started to feel. And as she started to feel, she discovered that the things that she thought she had left behind, the joy, the passions, were still there. And years later, somewhere on the downs, Left Eye told her story. And up on the downs in the evening sun, Left Eye felt her mother close by, walking with her hair blowing in the wind. Here, these birds for to hear 
I pray you pay attention and quickly draw near. And when you are old, you will have this to sing. You never heard so sweet, you never heard so sweet. You never heard so sweet as the birds in the spring. What had been clear blue skies was now a grey dripping shroud of fog. What had been calm still waters was now towering swell. The little boat rocked far from the shore and the thunder roared and Ashley was pushed down into the bottom of the boat where she could hear her father shouting instructions and her mother crying. Then there was a huge crack and the world went dark. Her mother had emerald green eyes and they shone, especially when she looked at Ashley. Her father's eyes were dark brown and when she looked into his eyes, she knew nothing bad could ever happen. That was before the accident. After the accident, there were no more emerald green eyes. And when she looked into her father's eyes, they were cloudy, unseeing. In time, her father took a new wife. Stepmother's eyes were small, black and beady. Stepmother had a daughter. Stepsister's eyes looked at Ashley sideways. In the beginning, stepmother and stepsister smiled at Ashley, but their smiles never met their eyes. Her father worked long hours and was often away from home. Be good, he said to Ashley, and she tried. Ashley longed to reclaim that first experience of radiant love. She watched it as children ran out of school into the arms of their parents. She saw the beams of love being exchanged between them. She saw the beam of love from stepmother to stepsister and thought if she could just get close to stepsister, then stepmother's gaze would land on her. But it went around her, over her, never landing on her. And when it did land on her, it narrowed to a point and her mouth opened like a clapper, emitting a volley of instructions. Wash the dishes, clean the floors, make the beds. Ashley, in her attempt to be good, tried to achieve her task, but no matter what she did, even when she anticipated them, it was never enough. The dishes had smears, the floor wasn't clean, the beds not straight. Failing in her chores had consequences, painful ones. While Ashley had tasks to do, stepsister lay on the sofa and watched TV. Where stepsister had designer trainers and cool clothes, Ashley had charity shop ones. At first, Ashley and stepsister shared a bedroom and then stepsister decided that Ashley was mm, too untidy, too smelly, too Ashley. So Ashley slept on a mattress in the corridor. Ashley hated school. She was picked on for not having the right clothes, for not having the right shoes. She became very good at becoming invisible. She was often tired and struggled with her homework. Occasionally, a kind teacher would notice the circles under Ashley's eyes and ask her if everything was okay at home. And Ashley, thinking of stepmother's rages and what she might do with the hoover flex, said, everything's just fine. The years passed. Stepmother had a friend. He came more and more often to the flat. He drank hands. Glug, glug, glug. Glug, glug, glug. And when he had finished, with large fists. His fingers were stained permanent yellow from the roll-ups that dangled from the corner of his mouth, stuck to his lower lip. One night, 
when Ashley was asleep, she was woken by large hands on her. She could smell stale beer and overflowing ashtrays. The same thing happened the next night and the next. On the third night, when all Ashley could hear was the nighttime noises of the flat, she picked up her single bag of possessions and slipped quietly out of the flat. As the rosy dawn pushed back the night sky, she hid by the railway station. When the station became busy, she attached herself to a large family and slipped unnoticed through the barriers and onto a train heading south to the sea. She followed the crowds to the sparkling water. And when a group of men with big hands approached her, she ran along the beach to where the walkway ran out and her feet sank into warm pebbles. Far, far at the end of the beach was a row of upturned boats and as the sun dropped below the horizon, Ashley slipped under one of those boats and slept. When she woke the next morning and emerged from the boat, a black and white dog was waiting for her. He appeared ownerless. Dog followed Ashley all that day and the next. They shared cold cartons of chips and discarded donuts. Ashley and Dog became inseparable. They spent all summer on the beach. Ashley would splash water on herself every morning, but even so, never really felt clean. They became known, some people kind. One man who owned a chip shop and ice cream parlor often gave them a carton of chips and occasionally an ice cream. Others were not so kind. When the group of men with big hands approached, Dog growled low. Then the weather changed. Biting winds and stinging rain blew in from the sea. The crowds disappeared, the bins emptied, and Ashley and Dog's empty bellies forced them into town. They went from place to place, each time being moved on by people with sad eyes and broken dreams. Ashley and Dog trudged the streets, Ashley stopping often to press her nose against the steam and glass of a cafe, longing to be inside, longing to feel the silky smooth of hot chocolate dripping down her dry throat and into her empty belly. When she held out a filthy hand with broken, black encrusted nails, passers-by would avert their eyes, wrinkle their noses, gather their children and hurry past. The weather worsened. The cold seeped into her every pore and right into her core. And she was ravenously hungry. It was as if a beast lived inside her stomach that could never be satiated. Ashley dreamt, not only of food, but of a place high up with a great door that no one could get through, with sheets that were sparkling crisp and white, of a hot shower she could stand under for hours and of a fridge that was bursting with food. One night, one of the men with the big hand approached her and thrust a can and a smoke at her. She shook her head, but he insisted. Briefly, the haze from the can and the smoke made her forget the fear and the loneliness. When she woke the next morning with a pounding headache, the man was back, demanding she steal from him. She shook her head, but he curled his lip and showed her his fist. Large hands with taut, tattooed skin. Ashley slept in the day when the streets were busy and at night she rode the buses around the town and up and down the coast. She had to keep moving. She knew if she was still, they would find her, surround her, they would harm her. One woman had had her sleeping bag set alight. Christmas was coming. The town was strewn with lights and shoppers were too encumbered by bags to search for a wallet to find a coin for a hungry young woman. On Christmas Day, the streets which the day before had been teeming with people were quiet, empty, deserted. The shops, dark and shuttered. Out of the town centre, the streets blazed with light and laughter. Even Dog was subdued. On Christmas night, Ashley and Dog returned to the beach. The moon hung in a huge, luminous ball, casting a ripple of liquid silver serpent across the water. Ashley had a can, glug, 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 and a smoke.
Dog was running in frantic circles, round and round and round, and suddenly, without any warning, Dog plunged into the sea. Ashley shouted, screamed, bellowed, but Dog, who always came when she called, ignored her. Ashley paused at the water's edge, then ripping off her shoes and her jacket, she took a step into the sea. <gasps> the cold bit into her like shards of ice. She took another step and another. Water was up to her knees and with the next step the beach shelved and Ashley was plunged out of her depth, unable to swim, limbs flailing, invisible arms reached up, curled around her and pulled her down into the icy darkness. Far ahead was a green light. Ashley was pulled by the ties through the water towards the light where they unfurled and tumbled her into a cave. There in the cave was an old, old woman. Her hair completely surrounded her and was full of chip cartons, chocolate wrappers, plastic rope and fishing hooks. Long curled nails scraped at the gravel and drifts of sand rose around her. As she could just make out a single cloudy red rimmed eye and a mouth of broken teeth. Comb my hair, child. Ashley spied a rake in the corner of the cave and taking the rake, she gently teased it through the woman's hair, removing the chip cartons, the chocolate wrappers, the plastic rope, the fishing hooks, and in amongst the debris of the ocean, she found a bone. And another, and another. When she had finished combing the woman's hair and it flowed freely around her, she presented the woman with the pile of bones. The woman gave such a cry of anguish, it went straight to Ashley's heart. The old woman laid the bones on the, out on the floor of the cave, bone to bone to bone to bone, until at last there lay the skeleton of a young woman. The old woman turned to Ashley with eyes of emerald green. It is not your turn, child. And Ashley was pulled out of the cave, propelled through the water and flung onto the beach. <gasps> she dragged herself up the beach and slipped under the boat where she slept fitfully. She was woken the next morning by a knocking. She froze, without dog to warn her. She had not heard footsteps approaching. Hi, is anyone there? Ashley waited. Footsteps crunched away from the boat. When she emerged, a young woman, not much older than herself, was leaning against another boat. She smiled at Ashley and her smile reached her grey eyes. Hot tea? Ashley approached her and took the steaming cup of warmth. The young woman told Ashley of a place on the edge of town, a place where she could have a hot shower and a cooked breakfast. Ashley knew of this place. She knew the men with the big hands went there. On this day, the woman said, they won't be there. Later, Ashley, head down, made her way to the small, square, shabby building on the edge of town. The door was opened by the woman with the grey eyes. Yellow light spilled across the walls and they were decorated with driftwood and shells and seaweed. In the centre of the room sat a group of women, some speaking, some quiet. They looked up as Ashley came in. This is Ashley, said the woman. They smiled. Nice to meet you. And they moved up to make room for her. She loved lemon the best Orange took to work with no time to rest Yes, orange took to work with no time to rest 
Oh, won't you pick that bubble to play? The mother told her to put it away. Go fetch the eggs, go milk the cow, till your work is done and the sweat on your brow. Till your work is done and the sweat on your brow. So won't you pick up the pitcher of glass? Off to the well she went so fast, but as she stooped to fulfil her goal, the pitcher slipped and fell down the hole. Yes, the pitcher slipped and fell down the hole. Oh, tears they roll down her face, in the mother's eyes she'll be a disgrace. Then a fairy appeared from the well With a branch in the hand and a healing spell With a branch in the hand and a healing spell That fairy tapped the branch to the ground What was lost there now was found The picture it stood shining bright With two arms and legs in the sunlight But with two arms and legs in the sunlight When she went homeward bound, her faithful pitcher's feet on the ground, and every day it would sweep the floor, her secret helper in one less chore. Her secret helper in one less chore. For once in a cottage there lived two girls, one dressed in rags and the other in pearls. The mother she loved lamb and the best, orange at the work with no time to rest. Yes, orange did the work with no time to rest. I'm going to share Duncan Williamson's Traveller Cinderella. Duncan Williamson was a Scottish traveller. He was born on the banks of Loch Fyne in a bow tent. He was a tradition bearer and knew 2,000 stories and about 3,000 songs, many of them ballads that he composed. And what I want to share to you today is his Traveller's Cinderella, but as um, composed as my ballad. Um, it's, I've put some Scottish words in it. So a gaddy is a man. And Burns and Weens are children, you probably knew that. Bleggering is calling out and crying out. The quarries were people who had children's homes and they looked after orphans, but unfortunately they were implicated in some traveller children being taken from their parents and sent to Canada. And the burkers were grave robbers. The puddocks are frogs. Uh, a Ben Mort is a grand noble woman and Ben Hantel is grand noble people. Duncan Williamson was a traveller gaddy fine, well storied on the banks of Loch Fine. And the best of those stories at furnace he availed from his father to his weans this tale. The travellers Cinderella as they tell it to their own. Maybe it's a one piro stole. But what's the truth? We'll wonder more. But here it is in the travellers law. Mother and father were real travelling kin. Granny Weens and the tent they lived in. Wandering the highlands, the warm summer fair, in winter still by grace of the lead. Well, the next new baby came along, and Granny brought her up as her own. And Mary gave Mary her love daughter Mary, and a fine young woman was grown. One cold, dark night they arrived at their scene, mother, father and many more weans. With little fear they built their tent, behind some trees their fire it went. This year the laird's consent may not be meant. 
A few days passed, they were not disturbed. So it seemed that most danger was curbed. No wean would be took by cruel quarry's book. No burker would sell them to a crook. T'was just before Christmas a parade rattled past. Benny Hand tool to the party at the castle. Mary ached for the company of lad and lass. T'was not to be, for from head to toe in rags was she. As evening fell, Granny went to the brook and hooked two puddocks on a crook. Hare's cabbage leaf and butterflea were carriage drive a white horsey, and a Benham mort was she. She stepped from the cart and was admired as art, and in love was the lad's unswelling heart. They waltzed beneath the great window with eye on moon she knew to go, and when it dropped, just a slipper left low. The carriage, the footman and the horses were gone, running free, her black hair shining long. She laughed in rags as home she flew, the lead sun lost but found a shoe. His heart was broken clean in two. His daddy found him weeping and bade him go a-reaping for foots that would fit snug and true. But no foots fit that crystal shoe, so peely wally bad his hue. Sad homeward bound, close he drew. They came to the wood curtain, sure love's lost was certain. And the traveller bends a blagger in, pulled them in. The parents were aghast to see huge country men on horses three. Would it be Holmes and jail or forced to flee? But twice through his tail the sun did regale Mother, father, then granny the detail They said they'd seen the Benimort But they knew nothing of her court Sorrowful son, his plan was thwart then out from her tent sauntered Mary as she went. Sun dropped from his mount for her consent. She rolled her eyes and humoured him. He told her love was not a whim. On bonny foot, glass shoes sat trim. It's her, it's her, my love, my queen. I'll take you right away from forest green. But Granny there and Father knew to leave was not the thing to do. He left alone till gloaming was through. But Father, he was not convinced. And he scorned Granny's magic as a witch. But Granny knew the best to call for Mary's son and families all. Love over ghoul would conquer all. As evening fell, Granny went to the brook and hooked two puddocks on a crook. Hare's cabbage leaf and butterflea were carriage drive a white horsey. And Mary shone with true nobility. And the best of all weddings was had by all. A feast for the belly, eyes and feet. They'd a huge bonny family. Son and Mary loved so happily. The family safe behind the wood curtain. For kind permission was considerably more certain. By mud moss, by hope stone, these hard words and stories sown. By mother's grave and by her.
Oh. 